Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our final Wednesday webinar, our Wednesday Gospel webinar. Joining me, of course, is Sister Lucy in room, and we have Sister Yasint and Sister Carino. Yay! Hi. Hello. So, Hello, Sister Yasint, do you want to say anything? Well, it's um, it, it's a great sadness and a great joy at, at the same time. The joy that we have done it. We've done it for four years. Um, by the time we managed to get our recordings up to scratch with, um, uh, you know, um, with the quality, <laughs> we lost the year. So that's why we've, we've done four years, but we've managed to cover the three year cycle of the gospel. So it's all done. And we, we are running out of things to say about the gospel. <laughs> So it's we have to stop and move on. Uh, I mean, there's not that the Gospels, we, we've come to the end of the Gospels because that's impossible. But our, We've come to the limit of our, our natural ability to talk about them. That's it. Uh, <laughs> and also we wanted also to, to do something a lot more interactive because these are very much lecture-like and we don't get to hear and see you all. And, and that's a bit frustrating. So that's why we're, we're moving on to our Wednesday communion. And that's going to be really exciting. And we're going to ponder together the first reading. And because our Hebrew is not great, um, we're going to have to rely on yours as well. So <laughs> it'll be more of a Lexia Divina than, than a up. lecture. <laughs> oh, sharp your Hebrew. <laughs> Start quoting it now. Yes. So that's why we, we're... Um, coming out of, you know, with just finishing with a with a, a wonderful gospel on, on Christ the King. Um, uh, Sister Dominic will lead the last webinar. Hello. And then we will have a break on next Wednesday. There will be nothing happening. We nothing. Won't, we won't know what to do with ourselves. We'll be wandering around. <laughs> <laughs> Randomly going, I should be doing something. Yeah, now. where is the what, what, what where is it chasm? Where's Alan? Where's Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then after that, we will uh, start on the 1st of December, our new Wednesday communion. And that should be um, amazing, we hope. We, we're a bit, you know, um, um, sort of, we're very much looking forward to it, but we're very much wondering what it's going to be like. And we're really relying on you to come and and participate and contribute because the Holy Spirit um, speaks through all the members of the church. So it's not because we're dressed up that we have any authority. Um, it's true. It's true. So we want to <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear Sister Carino agreeing there. Yeah. <laughs> We're an authority on dressing up. <laughs> we are an authority on dressing up and looking the same. <laughs> so there we are. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for this four years. It's been such a blessing. It's been absolutely wonderful to, to see this, this community of people who love the gospel building up and to be with you every week exploring the gospel together. It's been a real privilege for us. And we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed it. Of course, when I started coming to the webinar, I didn't think I'd be this side of the camera. Yeah. So it's been an interesting little journey for me yeah. as well to go from being a webinee to a webinary. You've passed <laughs> through, the, through the looking glass, Sister Dominic. So yes. let's just be a lesson to any of you out there who are, you know, thinking this could never be me. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're married, in um, which case it's it's or a man. Sorry, Alan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we are. So there we yeah, are. So please come to the Wednesday communion so we can hear your voice and see your face. It would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. These, these will we won't be recorded, so there will be much more sort of you know informal. Um, yes, informal. Exactly. Yes. We need to, we have one, two weeks to prepare them now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there we are. So we'll leave you to the good hands of Sister Dominic and Sister Luce, no, Sister Cooey. Sister Cooey, yeah. Oh, who starts to be in Divinity at Maryville? I think it's, is that, is that Marie? I think it's Marie. Yeah, Marie. 
Oh, Ooh, congratulations! I'm in I'm in year three at the moment. She's still alive, hey. and I've survived so far. So, <laughs> or best of best wishes with your studies. You'll really enjoy it. You'll absolutely love it. Excellent. Brilliant. Also, Holly, you can wear whatever you like, <laughs> or drink whatever you like. I mean, we're kind of stuck with water here, but you guys aren't. Yeah. It could make it for a very interesting Wednesday communion. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> We're getting giddy now. We, we are, are getting giddy. giddy. I'm going to kick all of these guys out because right. I have got a webinar to do. Oh, that's true. <laughs> all right, then. And there's lots of stuff. Dominic, get down. Dominic, to everyone. Goodbye. Bye. And <laughs> see you in two weeks' time. Bye bye. <laughs> do I do? How do I leave the webinar? <laughs> This is not a question we want to answer online. <laughs> oh, yeah, just close the window. Okay, bye. I'm, I'm just going to watch these guys trying to get off the webinar for a minute. There we go. <laughs> so welcome to our um, last webinar. You are all very welcome. Sister Cooey is on the chat box. Maybe Sister Cooey might pop into me at the end just to say her buys as well. But for the moment, she is manning or womaning the chat box very well for me. Um, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at a very beautiful gospel, Christ the King, um, because we've started late and because I tend to talk too much, as you well know at this point, I've already pre-recorded the podcast of tonight. So I'm going to send you the link for that just in case I don't get through everything that I wanted to say to you this evening. It's already there for you. Also pop into the shared files and download the files. As usual, I've put far too much in the scripture references document. Um, but again, it's just to allow you to go deeper should you want to. So why don't we kick off with a prayer as we always do. And uh, let us begin by entrusting ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the author of scripture. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of our faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we come to our gospel for the solemnity of Christ, the universal King. It's from John's gospel, from chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Are you the King of the Jews? Pilate asked. Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent my being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. So you are a king then, said Pilate. It is you who say it, answered Jesus. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to my voice. So we look at the literal meaning, as we always do, and we encourage you to do the same when you're coming to any piece of scripture asking our six questions, where, when, what, who, how, and why. It's just a really useful technique to begin looking at scripture. Where are we? Well, in John's gospel, we're in chapter 18 of John. Um, physically, geographically, we're in the Praetorium. This is taking place during the Passion of Jesus. And Jesus answers Pilate's questions. He's awaiting judgment. The two characters who are present in today's gospel are Jesus and Pilate. And how is this taking place? We have this mysterious dialogue where Pilate is trying to figure out who Jesus is. 
because Jesus want, or Pilate wants to establish his guilt. And it also gives Jesus the opportunity to witness to the truth. So the question that we begin with is that of Jesus's kingship or his reign or his sovereignty. And this question appears in the three synoptic gospels as well. You can see it there in Matthew 27, 11, in Mark 15, 2, and in Luke 23, 3. Each of the Gospels record that Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, you say so. However, the fourth Gospel, John's Gospel, takes the traditional passion component, this question and answer about the kingship of Jesus, and he develops it into the governing motif of the trial. So King Basilius is used nine times in the trial before Pilate. And if you have a look at your scripture document, ref uh, scripture references, you will see there I've highlighted and read the number of times that the King of the Jews or King is used. So we see it there in 833. Are you the King of the Jews? And then later on, Pilate says, you are a king then. And Jesus says, you say that I am a king. And then we come to Pilate addressing the crowd. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And then when the soldiers are mocking Jesus again, they say, hail king of the Jews. And of course, this carries on as well. In um, 18 and 19, chapters 18 and 19, so anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. This is the crowd shouting back at Pilate. And again, Pilate says, here is your king. Shall I crucify your king? And again, the crowd says, we have no king but Caesar. And again, we see this coming up with the crucifixion of Jesus. We see it here that the sign that was placed on Jesus's cross was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Of course, we also have come across this already in John's Gospel. Right back at the start of John's Gospel in chapter one, we have Nathaniel who said to Jesus, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the King of Israel. And again, in chapter six of John, where we have this, um, John six, of course, is the Eucharistic discourse in John. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And if we jump to John 12, we have the triumphal entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. And we read, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a colt. So the prominence of the kingship motif underscores the intersection of religion and politics in this trial narrative. Political sedition, which is basically what the Jews are accusing Jesus of, that fell under the jurisdiction of the Roman courts. And Pilate's questioning about Jesus's political claims, whether he's a king or not, points to the Roman awareness of the potential threat that Jewish messianic hopes uh, pose to their governance. Yet for John, the kingship motif also has a theological significance. And throughout the trial, John plays the political against the theological and vice versa. Also typical of John's Gospel, Jesus replies to Pilate's question with a question. We see this already in John 3 verses 9 to 10, where Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus and Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus answers him with a question. Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? And again, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples in John 11, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you 
and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. And then during the farewell discourse in John chapter 14, we have Thomas um, saying to Jesus, you know, show us the way. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So Jesus is using the questioning of Pilate to draw him out, to ask him another question. Is it you who say it, or have others spoken to you about me? Jesus' words there move to the heart of Pilate's depiction in this trial, for they question whether Pilate can act on his own, or is he only acting in response to others. In addition, Jesus' question signals the direction the rest of the trial will take, because he turns the tables on Pilate, and Jesus himself becomes the interrogator. Now, Pilate's response to Jesus is also pivotal in understanding both Pilate's character in this trial and its political undertones. His initial question, Pilate's initial question, are you the king of the Jews, is introduced with the Greek word meti, which anticipates a negative response and its sense is accurately um, reflected in the New Revised Standard Version of the Gospel, where Pilate says, I am not a Jew, am I? Instead of, am I a Jew, which we read in our liturgical translation. So in this question, even in that question, Pilate expresses his disdain for the Jews. And that disdain is actually consistent with the description of Pilate in Josephus, Pilate was the Roman procurator of Judea from 26 to 36 AD. Um, the image that emerges from the Jewish and Roman accounts of his procuratorship is that of a mean-spirited and hard ruler. The portrait of Pilate in the Synoptic Gospels is more benign, probably under the influence of pro-Roman Christian apologetics. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, we see that Pilate is being portrayed as being innocent of the blood of Jesus. So in Matthew 27, verses uh, 24 to 26, we see there, so when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And also in Luke, Pilate is portrayed as being convinced of Jesus's innocence. And we see this four, well, three places really in Luke chapter 23. In verse four, Pilate says to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. And then later on in verses um, 14 to 16, here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And again, in verses 22 onwards, and a third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence to death, sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. However, in John's Gospel, the Johannine portrait of Pilate in the trial narrative is far more consistent with the character of Pilate in the non-Christian accounts. The Pilate that emerges from John's Gospel is antagonistic. He's scornful of the Jews, but just because he's scornful of the Jews doesn't mean that he's Jesus's ally. Um, he's not trying to convince the Jewish authorities of Jesus's innocence. Rather, Pilate is driven primarily by political expedience, like the Jewish leaders were in John 11. So we see here in John 11 verses 46 to 53, some of the Pharisees, some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. 
if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. So we, again, we see here political expedience. It's better for one man to die for the nation. However, Pilate, on the other hand, is being portrayed as somebody who is singularly unconcerned with questions of guilt or innocence when it comes to Jesus. In John 18, Pilate says to the Jews, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And again, in John 18, in verse 38, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? You see, if Pilate found Jesus innocent, if he really cared about whether he was innocent or not, Pilate could just have let him go. He didn't have to engage with this farce of this custom of whether or not to release him. Pilate really doesn't care about Jesus. And in John 19, Pilate therefore said to him, said to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? In fact, Pilate involves himself in Jesus's trial as a means to humiliate the Jews and to ridicule their national hopes by means of Jesus. Even the sign fastened to the cross is meant to humiliate the Jews. Now, I have to admit the first time, well, pretty much until this year, every time I read um, this, every time I read this uh, account of the sign being fastened over Jesus's cross, I had assumed it was because Pilate was beginning to get an inkling of the truth. However, according to the commentary that I was reading, it's suggesting that Pilate was using this as yet another example to have a dig at the Jews. Look, we're crucifying your king. Um, so Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not right, the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So, there is no pro-Roman, anti-Jewish apologetic in the portrayal of Pilate's role in Jesus's death. Pilate's response to Jesus and his culpability are brought to the foreground here to show the extent of Jesus's judgment over the world. And again, that disdain for the Jews is shown right throughout the trial. You see here that Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged in um, chapter 19 of John's Gospel. And then they make a mockery of Jesus. They dress him in purple in the robes of a king. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then Pilate brings Jesus out, is still wearing the crown of thorns, still wearing the purple robe, and says to the crowd, here is the man. And again, he reiterates the fact, here is your king. You can almost hear Pilate's voice dripping with sarcasm. So Pilate's reference to your own nation and people in verse 35 Am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Recalls the Sanhedrin's meeting that I just talked about in John 11. You do not understand, as Caiaphas said, that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than the whole nation destroyed. So again, we have this concept of we are in a power struggle between the Jews and between the Romans, it's like, who's going to get the upper hand here? So it's, it's a matter of self-interest. 
it's a matter of political expediency, as I said. And even if we look at verse 35, where um, Pilate says, you know, am I a Jew? It is your own people. Well, there's a little theological irony in there because for John, the Jews represent the world's resistance to the revelation of God in Jesus. So Pilate anticipates a negative answer to his question. He asks, am I a Jew? And he expects Jesus to say, no, you're not a Jew. But the trial will show that, in fact, in John's understanding of the term Jew, Pilate is a Jew because he belongs with those who reject Jesus. So Pilate's question is similar to the Pharisee's question in John 940 in the account of the healing of the man born blind. We see there in John 9, 35 to 41. Jesus heard that they had driven him out and he found him and he has this beautiful discourse with the man who was born blind. And then some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? And the answer was, yes, they were blind because they refused to see that Jesus was the son of God that Jesus was able to work this miracle because he came from God. So that false certitude, we're not all blind, are we? I'm not a Jew. That exposes one's response to Jesus. In verses 36 to 38, then, Jesus describes what his kingdom is. He answers the question that Pilate has asked him in verse 33, are you a king? And in verse 35, what have you done? So in verse 36, Jesus defines his kingship by saying what it is not. So he says, mine is not a kingdom of this world. And he goes on to describe what is that kingdom would be if it had been of the world. So he defines his kingship by saying what it is not. And then in verse 37, he gives a, a positive description of what he has done. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to my voice. So when we are looking at this idea of king and kingdom, you see here it's translated, mine is not a kingdom of this world. Actually, a more accurate translation is kingship because a kingdom refers to a place, whereas Jesus, when he says, my kingdom is not of this world, really he's saying is my kingship is not of this world. Jesus is king, not of a place, but of people. So he is referring to the origin of his kingship, as well as, um, as his own mission, that both are coming from God. So you see this in John, um, forgive me, my screen has jumped slightly. In John 3.31, the one who comes from above is above all. Jesus is speaking of himself. The one who comes from heaven is above all. In John 8, 23, again, Jesus says, I am from above, I am not of this world. And in John 8, 42, I came from God and now I am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. And again, in John 16, 28, I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. So the kingship of Jesus and the origin of Jesus are both the same. They come from God the Father. And again, Jesus illustrates this very clearly when he says in John 15, if you belonged to the world, the world would love you as its own because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. If you belong to the kingdom or kingship of Jesus, 
well, then it's natural that the world would hate you because you are not of the world. The difference between Pilate's understanding of kingship and Jesus's understanding of kingship is underscored in verse 36, which provides an illustration of the contrast between belonging to God and belonging to the world. In verse 36, Jesus says, Mine is not a kingdom of the world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent my being surrendered to the Jews. Now, the word that's used for men there, it also means followers, or it can also mean, um, it literally means servants. And that same word is used to describe the Jewish police, the temple police, the police of the temple. And we see this in various places in John chapter 18. We see it here in verse 3. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And again, Jewish police is referenced in verse 12 and in verses 18 and 22. So it's ironic that Jesus is using the same term for his followers, his disciples, his men, as the temple officers. Of course, we also remember, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> we also remember the account from the Garden of Gethsemane where they have come for Jesus and Peter, who has the sword, takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Jesus is reiterating again, his kingship is unlike any other kingship. So now we come to finding God and we lead into that from the last words of Jesus. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth and all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. So we've been discussing the kingship of Jesus and the kingship is very much related to his witnessing the truth. Jesus has already spoken extensively about his mission as one who witnesses. We see it here in John 3. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies. He is a witness to what he has seen and heard. Yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. Jesus came into the world to testify to the truth about God. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. We have it again in John 18, verses 14 to 18. Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, because I know where I have come from and where I am going but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. And I'm going to jump on to verse 16. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf. And the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. And of course, Jesus speaks most clearly about the truth when he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. This is the truth to which Jesus bears witness. And that's the truth through which the kingship of Jesus bears witness too. And we'll see that when we come on to looking at finding the church. So again, in John 17, we have Jesus speaking to his heavenly father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have, as you have sent me into the world, 
so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they may also be sanctified in the truth. So you see this deep connection between the kingship of Jesus, his sovereignty, his reign, and the mission of Jesus in the world. We know that Jesus was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but to save us as we have in John 3.16 and here we have in John 3.17 onwards. They have not believed in the name of the only Son of God and this is the judgment. People love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. If we choose lies, if we choose darkness over light, over truth, then that is our judgment. Jesus, in a sense, doesn't have to judge us because we've already judged ourselves. Again, in John 6, in that great, beautiful Eucharistic discourse, Jesus reaffirms that he has come down from heaven not to do his own will, but the Father's will. And in John 9, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Again, it's personal choice, it's freedom. God presents the truth to us. It's up to us whether we accept that truth or not. I'm going to skip on a little bit. The next thing that we can look at in relation to Jesus is this idea that Jesus is the shepherd king. And of course, we're well familiar with um, John 10, where Jesus speaks about himself uh, being the good shepherd. And he says, the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. So in today's gospel, the expression that everyone who belongs to the truth listens to the voice of Jesus that recalls the claim of the Good Shepherd in John 10. Also, this is carried on later in John 10, towards the end of John 10, we have it in verses 22 to 30. Uh, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. And again, we have it in John 8, whoever is from God hears the words of God. And John 12, Jesus again reiterates that the words that he speaks are the words of God. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as the Father has told me. So to belong to the truth is to belong to Jesus' sheep. Knowing the truth and being a disciple of Jesus, they're synonymous. They're two ways of saying exactly the same thing. To hear Jesus is to hear the Father. The Good Shepherd pastoral imagery in the Old Testament especially um, had political overtones. So in the Old Testament, the king was often described as a shepherd. And we have that in chapter 34 of Ezekiel. I'm not going to read it because it is quite a long chapter, but I have put it in there so that you can have a look at it at your own um, leisure. Chapter 34 first describes Israel's false shepherds, and then it goes on to describe God as the true shepherd. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered. I will gather them. I will feed them. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord. I will seek the lost, I will bring, bring back the strayed and bind up the injured, I will strengthen the weak. So this is what Jesus is fulfilling now, this is the purpose for Jesus coming into the world. This is the theological context in which we can um, interpret the discussion of Jesus's kingship. Jesus is the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep. As we've already touched on, Jesus is also the eschatological judge, the judge at the end of time. And so when Pilate says 
in response to Jesus's words about being a witness to the truth, Pilate says, you know, what is truth? We don't have it in today's gospel. It's literally the verse after today's gospel. Jesus asks that of the one who is truth. So Pilate again unknowingly shows that he is not one of Jesus's sheep. Another way that we can um, find out about Jesus is by comparing his kingship to the kingship of the world. Jesus Christ is humble and vulnerable. Look at even the um, human kings described in the Old Testament. Solomon, dressed in splendid clothes and built a magnificent temple. David led his army to victory in numerous battles. Pharaoh maintained an iron rune over the Egyptians and their Israelite slaves. Meanwhile, Jesus lay in a manger, shared meals with the poor and public sinners, and hung stripped and bloodied on the cross. He never looked very much like a king. And as we're coming into Advent, and as we're coming to prepare for the first coming of Jesus at Christmas, it's worth keeping that in mind. What are the ways in which we can imitate Jesus's humility and vulnerability? Because that is one of the ways in which he would like us to exercise our kingship. Jesus, Jesus's kingship is a sovereignty of truth, as we've already seen. We can have a look at some excerpts from um, from the Catechism just to help us unpack that a little bit more. Um, so in 2465, the Old Testament attests that God is the source of all truth. His word is truth, his law is truth, and his faithfulness endures to all generations. And here again, we see the comparison between light and truth and darkness and lies. In Jesus Christ, the whole of God's truth has been made manifest, full of grace and truth, he came as the light of the world. Again, that's quoting from the first chapter of John's Gospel. He is the truth. So to follow Jesus is to live in the truth, live in the spirit of the truth, whom the Father sends in his name and who leads into all the truth. Now, truth is one of the mottos of the Dominicans, Veritas. But as we always say, it is Veritas and Caritatis, truth and love. God's very being is truth and love, as we see here in paragraph 231 of the Catechism. So God is truth. God is truth itself. His words cannot deceive. And this is why one can abandon oneself in full trust to the truth and faithfulness of his word in all things. God is also truth when he reveals himself. The teaching that comes from God is true instruction. God is also love. And that love which God has for us, it's sheer, it's gratuitous, it's a free gift. God doesn't have to love us, he chose to love us. It is the love of a father for a son. It is an everlasting love. It is a faithful love. So God is truth and love. And so that brings us on to finding the human person. How can we allow the truth to reign in us? And we can do that by looking at our nature, first of all, and then by employing the moral virtues, which I'll unpack a little bit more. So let's have a quick look at our catechism references again. Man tends by nature towards the truth. We are made for God. God is the truth. And so we are made for the truth. We tend by our nature towards the truth. We are obliged to honor and bear witness to the truth. We are impelled both by our nature and also by our moral obligation to seek the truth because we have been given an intellect and a will. So our intellect is built for the truth. It's built for knowing. Our will is built for choosing the good, choosing that which is good. So again, you see truth and love working together, our intellect and will working together. 
I'm going to skip on because it's quarter to eight already and we need to um, move on quickly. So I'm going to move on to the virtues. Human virtues are firm attitudes. So they're, they're human. They're something that we do. They're stable because they, I can't be um, prudent today or prudent in this moment and imprudent in the next. They are stable dispositions. They are perfections of the intellect and will. So they help us to govern how we use our intellect and knowing and how we use our will in choosing the good. And the four cardinal virtues are prudence, temperance, fortitude, and what's the other one? Forgive me. It is prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. Of course, it's justice. So the first one we're going to quickly look at is prudence. And prudence means, it's a quick, short definition here, right reason in action. It's using our intellect to know the truth and then disposing ourselves to choose the good in every situation. So a prudent person is someone who applies himself or herself to know what is true, what is based in reality, and then to choose the good based on that. And it helps us to practice prudence then because when we come to difficult cases, it helps us to overcome error and doubt. And of course, the Holy Spirit, when we are baptized, helps us, moves us, infuses those moral virtues with grace so that we get even more helps, if you like, as baptized people. Justice then, that's the human virtue, virtue, the moral virtue, uh, the virtue that helps us to make good decisions. That's what we mean by moral. And that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbour. So, for example, religion, worshipping of God, is an act of justice because that's what is due to God. We owe God our worship. So justice, again, is incorporating both our intellect and our will. It means um, being habitually right thinking and the uprightness of conduct. So again, intellect, right thinking and will are conduct. Fortitude is one we need almost every day, especially in today's world. It's the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of good. We are bombarded with so many messages today from outside of ourselves that are not in any way Catholic or Christian. And so we do need fortitude to stand up, to stand in our identity as Christians and to bear witness to the truth. And then temperance. Temperance is that virtue which moderates the attractions of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created good. Again, it's about knowing what is good for us knowing what the ultimate good is, which is God, and using our will to choose that good over others. I'm going to move very quickly onto the church. The church is going to be a bit of a whirlwind, I'm afraid. Um, but I have sent you the link to download everything else because there's a few things I want to share with you before I finish this evening. So the church is the kingdom of God. God has endowed the church with his spirit, the spirit of truth, he protects the church, especially in the areas of um, faith and morals, that the church will proclaim the truth. She is a sacrament of the truth because the church makes present the truth in the world. She gives us the real presence of Jesus, who is the truth, the way, the truth and the life. She also is a sacrament of the truth by giving us the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, because the spirit comes to us through the church, through our baptism. So again, I'm just going to click very quickly onto um, our catechism references, because I just want to share one paragraph with you. And it's this here. 
851, the missionary motivation. It is from God's love for all men that the church in every age receives both the obligation and the vigor of her missionary dynamism. Why? Because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the purpose of the church. The church is to preach the will of God. The church is to preach salvation. The church is to preach the truth. And what happens when we preach the truth? Well, we are all called as Christians, as baptized people, by the example of our lives and the witness of our words, both have to go together. Wherever they live, we have an obligation to manifest the new man that we've put on in baptism, to manifest what it means to be a Christian, to reveal the power of the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. So you are called to be a witness. You are called to be possibly a martyr because a martyr is a witness, one who bears witness even unto death. That's what we're all called to do. Some of us may not be called to be red martyrs, um, we may not be called to actually physically shed our blood, but we are called perhaps to be white martyrs, to endure persecution. And why do we do this? We do this because we know the truth. We know that Jesus spoke the truth, that he is the truth. So I'm going to leave it there. As I said, uh, because there are a few things that I'm going to share with you now, the podcast, which contains a fuller explanation of this evening, and which can also be used to send you to sleep if you wish. Um, the podcast is there that has the full explanation of the scripture and catechism references. What I also want to do is give you the Wednesday communion link, which will not be for next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we're having the evening off. Woo! Um, but the following Wednesday, the first Wednesday in December, December 1st, actually, we will be starting our Wednesday communion. It will be Alexis Divina on the first reading of the um, mass readings. So if you like the style of finding the four senses, we'll still be finding the four senses in the um, in the first reading, the Old Testament reading for the Sundays. However, we will be doing it more in Alexia Divina style. So there will be more interaction. We'll be doing it on Zoom, so we'll be able to see each other if you wish, um, even in your pajamas, and if you wish. <laughs> and we will be having a little bit of fellowship and prayer together as well, which will be beautiful. Now I come to another very important announcement. Uh, we are Dominicans, which means we are mendicants, which means we are beggars, and we rely on divine providence to live. So if you have been touched by our Wednesday Gospel webinars or by the work that we're trying to do in the name of the Lord, all for his glory, we are going to ask for a donation if you can afford it. We know it's pandemic times. We know for a lot of people, life has been extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult. We know we're coming up to Christmas. OK, OK, I've mentioned the C word. Um, but if you can afford something, you are giving it to God, not to us. And we very, very, very much appreciate it. If you can't afford anything, God bless you. God reward you. And please, please pray for us, um, because that is the greatest good you can give us, is asking the Lord to bless us. Um, so I'm going to just let you know about two other quick things before we finish. And uh, I'm going to invite Sister Cooey to come find me um, so that she can say her goodbyes as well. On that link, pffm.org.uk, you will see two um, new things that are coming up. The first is from next Monday, for four Monday evenings from 7 p.m. onwards, we have four sessions um, for parents, grandparents, catechists, teachers, everyone passionate about fostering love for the Eucharist in our children, led by Sister Yassant and by Angela Wood. It is, oh, of course, just give me one second, Sister Cooey, and I'll find you. There we go. I'll give you 
Oh, that's weird. You have permission, Sister Cooey. You just have to turn it on at the top, apparently, according to the settings here. Or pop into me here in the uh, library and you can say hello that way. So four Monday nights on fostering um, love for the Eucharist in children. It's going to be amazing. We have witnesses from different parents who are going to get involved to tell you what they do. Um, I can't wait for it myself, even though I'm not a child or a parent. Um, well, a spiritual parent, perhaps. And the other thing that we're going to let you know about is the Reader's Workshop, which starts on the 4th and the 11th of December. It runs over two Saturdays. And again, you'll find the details there on the PFFM website. Um, Sister Cooey still apparently can't come in. Uh, so I'm going to make her an attendee and I'm going to turn her on that way. And hopefully she will be able to click on your microphone and your camera, Sister Cooey, and just come in very quickly to say hello. Hopefully somebody will be able to do that. So again, it just remains for me now uh, before Sister Cooey can come in and say goodbye to thank you so much for everything, uh, for your faithfulness for your support, for your encouragement, for your prayers, for all that you do for us. Um, we are so, so blessed to be a part of your lives. And thank you so much for being part of ours. Oh, I'm sorry, Sister Cooey. Here's Sister Cooey for us. I was us. pressing the button and then it just went, bah, you're no longer a light in. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Sad. <laughs> That's very sad. We'll see you all next week in what, fortnight's time? Yeah, fortnight's First of time. December. Bring yeah. your Bible for some Lexio. Do and bring yeah. your bring your missile. Missiles yeah. are also good. Because oh yeah, they're doing the first reading. First reading. Yeah. Missile. That way you have the right translation. <laughs> I know it's just popped up. Oh there. my lord! <laughs> <laughs> the computer, Sister Dominic's computer, now says that my camera is going to be on and my video permission is now on. I'm just in the wrong room. There we go. There we Different. go. Anyway, we're almost ready to finish. So thank you all so much for everything. Oh, yes, Universalis. Amazing, Marie. You will get the readings there. It's free if you're only looking at the reading a week ahead. So that will be a very good and free option to us or for us as well. Um, Joanne, just one moment, please. And I'll send you a link. You can send it to us via bank transfer or via via even paypal um we really do appreciate anything you can give us but, but as i say prayers most important speaking of prayer nice little segue there this is our link for church services tv we shall be going to adoration please god um in quarter of an hour here we go so you are more than welcome to join us um joanne i'll ask sister yasen to send it on to you that way you are more than welcome to join us for our exposition and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, which takes place every evening from 8.15 to 8.45, followed by Compline on a Sunday, because we have an early night. It takes place from 7.30 to 8 for adoration and then 8 o'clock for Compline. Um, we carry you all in our hearts. There are 836 people registered for this uh, click meeting over the last four years. Um, so needless to say, we have a lot of praying to do. Speaking of praying, I like how I'm operating tonight. Many, many seamless segues. I finally got this down on the very, very last day of um, doing the webinar. So we're going to entrust ourselves, entrust you to Our Lady as we finish. And I invite you to pray with me. Mary, Virgin and Mother, you who moved by the Holy Spirit, welcomed the word of life in the depths of your humble faith. As you gave yourself completely to the Eternal One, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call as pressing as ever to proclaim the good news of Jesus, Mother of the Living Gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones. Pray for us. Amen.